What does this Omega 1045 movement and the Shell Corporation have in common? The answer is vast quantities of reserve oil. And it may not look bad from this distance, but I'm going to scoot you in and we'll take a look a bit closer. And thanks to this clear plastic cover, we can actually see what's going on under here. And I'll be able to show you the actual chronograph parts in operation as well. And anybody who has a more modern TSO chronograph is very likely going to have an ETA C01211 movement in. And that movement is almost a direct clone of this particular movement. There are a couple of little changes. The VPH on the 5100 is 28,800. It's a high beat movement. On the CO1211, it is reduced to 21,600 VPH. And the minute recording hand is centrally mounted on this and is often shown with a wing tip. Um, which I think is quite nice, makes it makes it quite unique. On the ETA version, the minute recorder is just on a separate wheel, and uh, whereas this has the three subdials as you would expect, but one of those subdials, the one up here, is a 24-hour counter. The one down here is a 12-hour recorder, and then the one on the left-hand side is your running seconds. So up close and personal, we can take a bit of a look. Here you can see I've removed the wheel for the running 24 hour recorder. None of the other wheels are removable at this point until this clear plate is removed. But uh, as I say, thankfully underneath this, you can see all the workings. So for those who are curious as to what clicks and moves where when you press the pushers, this is a great movement to show it on. And this here is the sliding rapid date change uh, for the calendar wheel. All these slightly darker patches are oil. They're great big puddles of oil. It's almost like it's been dipped. So all of these chrono works, here's the, the column wheel or pillar wheel, and then the operating levers and what have you. And the whole thing is designed to be relatively simple to mass produce with simple components. So they're hinged on, uh, on very simple, um, mechanisms rather than having anything too complex or very thick levers as you would find in a more vintage chronograph pillar wheel chronograph and i hope this comes across on screen but i'm just going to click a couple of the bits and pieces to try and show you so you can see all right and if i can get this in here adequately I need to resort that hole but if you watch just just down here where I'm pushing in the reset pusher let's get that lined up a little better and if you watch just down here now you can see there hopefully you could see there that huge puddle of oil and if I just wiggle this about a little bit like so look at that isn't that glorious? It's uh, it's amazing. I've, uh, there's so much in here. I'm thinking about calling in a, a reclamation company to siphon this off and purify it and bottle it for me. Uh, it's, it's quite incredible. And it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere under this plate. It's, it's truly remarkable. So let's uh, pop that back around a little bit. I need to rejig this movement holder to fit but you can see it again there as I press this lever you can see the areas where the oil puddles are moving so we've got we've got oil puddles up here over here around here there is it's quite literally everywhere it's it really is caked with it and there's there's just no need whatsoever you can see puddles of it over here uh, but that's a good example of the pillar wheel in operation sorry i'll try and get that in frame for you again there we go so there you can see the pillar wheel in operation and this is the run position the stop position and you can tell by these large indents for this top 
which this bottom pusher assembly locks into with the reset hammers. I will zoom out and show you uh, a sort of a, a zoomed out view so you can see the whole thing. So now we've got the whole movement on the screen. I'm just going to cycle through that a few times so that you can see the whole thing in operation. So it's currently in the stop position and we're now in the run position. And if you watch this lever here and the way that it moves across, unfortunately I can't remove the calendar driving wheel there to get you a better view because that's actually fixed in place on, on this plate here. But if you watch this lever here, this mechanism here which, is, which bears against the pillar wheel and then this which actually operates the pillar wheel and pulls it around in an anti-clockwise direction and all the interconnecting pieces of it, if you watch that as I actuate it, you can hopefully see how the whole thing moves. And for each press, it will either drop into where this arm is in, in a divot of the top plate, which would be the equivalent of a pillar or column or a gap accordingly. But these are all stamped and very, very thin, allowing the movement to be very complex to have um, a wide variety of functions uh, because it has a calendar function, a 12 hour recorder function, a minute recorder function, a second sweep function and a running seconds. All crammed into this tiny little face which is remarkable and all for a very thin movement which I will show you the thickness of in a moment. Bearing in mind of course that a dial sits on the top of this so we've got the calendar ring and then a dial on the top and then we have an oscillating weight on the bottom for the automatic works. But I'm just gonna cycle through that a few more times so you can see what's going on there. And the one thing you will notice is there doesn't seem to be anything much beyond cycling the pillar wheel. And that's because the magic, as it were, the bit that drives the chronograph is actually underneath in the movement. And I will show you that in a moment. So as you can see there, we'll move that around to, to this point here and then press the reset. And hopefully you saw that there. So we'll just do that again for you. And what this does is it drives in these hammers here to reset the wheels to the zero position. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put that into the run position. I'm going to flip this over just so that you can see the back of the movement. Very, very simple. It has, as you can see, a mixture of plastic and uh, metal components. These, this is plated brass and again, very common, uh, very commonly seen um, Omega colouring. The difference, another difference between this and the CO1211 ETA movement is that it uses a conventional escape wheel and pallet fork. The ETA, two, uh, the ETA CO1211 uses a plastic escape wheel and a plastic pallet fork, which is quite fascinating. I believe the material that they use is Delrin, which is a, a fabulous um, plastic for machining. It's very tough, it machines well, and it, and it performs well under a variety of conditions and doesn't suffer terribly with solvents and lubricants and such, which is a good thing in this case, because especially the lubricants side of it. And the spacing, as you can see, is made up of these plastic plates. That's what provides the space between the bridges. And the whole movement thickness, as you can see here, in fact, I'll take that out of the case so that you can see that a, a little bit better, is like so. The oscillating weight fits as high as the little indent on this post, which is where the spring clip that holds it in place. There's a, a bridge and a wheel which sits here, which, which acts as part of the automatic winding mechanism. It's a unidirectional winding mechanism. And this was also caked in oil underneath. I have no doubt whatsoever that when I take this bridge off that I will also find lots of oil underneath here. But what I'm gonna show you just now is the mechanism which operates the 
the chronograph itself, if I can just fit this securely in here. Like so. And I'm going to try and get that focused for you, bear with. And you can see there the there's a double stacked plastic and metal wheel. And this is a, a type of vertical clutch assembly. And this is currently in the run position. Now, hopefully, you can see there, when I press that into the stop position, this separates. It's actually very tricky to demonstrate that. I should, in fact, I shall just pop the pallets out and I should be able to show you a bit more easily. So I'll be back in a moment. Just make sure that all the power is released. Removing, lifting the click there. And it's always something of a shock if you forget to do that and uh, you pop off the pallets and, and the whole thing spins around like a turbine. And much to my expectations and not to my surprise, the pallet fork is stuck to the pallet bridge. That's usually a sign of the pallet fork pivot having been oiled. And that is a possibility here. I will have to inspect that closely shortly, but just for the moment, I'm gonna pop that aside. And what this should enable us to do is now rotate this little wheel. So I'll just refocus for you again. So at the moment, hopefully you can see that these are separated. And if I give that a little bit of a wind so that the mainspring barrel drives that, you can see that the only thing moving currently is the plastic ring. If I now press the start and put it into the start position, now you can see it's moving the metal section above it and you can also see the heart just down in fact, it's, if I get it there, that the heart is in the center of the screen just now. And as you see, if I put a little bit of wind on the mainspring barrel, you can now see that rotate. And that is your chrono center seconds heart. And again, if I press the stop, you'll notice as well, there's a lot of drag on that. And one of the things wrong with this is it ran, this watch only ran very, very briefly and it would only run with the chronograph running and only briefly. It would maybe manage about two, two or three minutes before it stopped, even on a full wind. And then as soon as you stop the chronograph, the whole thing would just stop completely. Um, you can see the beautiful concentricity of that escape wheel there. Mm -hmm. And then once again, with that engaged, we'll disengage that. I'll see if I can press the reset. I'm not sure if I'll be able to quite get in here, but but you should see. Oh, bear with me a second. A little bit of readjustment required. What I'm trying to, uh, hopefully what I'm trying to show here is the chronograph heart in the center resetting when I press the reset button. There you go. I don't know, that's probably very tricky to see, but you can see that that snapped back to a, a preset position and you can just see the hammer down there operating on the face of the heart. Very, very difficult to see, but it's down there. So that's just a quick and dirty example of how this chronograph functions. It's, it's in, in essence, a vertical clutch type mechanism where friction connects these two wheels, uh, which is part, so you've got a wheel that's part of the train and then a wheel that's part of the chronograph mechanism. And the friction binding them together drives the chronograph. So it's a little unusual, but they are a surprisingly nice movement 
and they're a very, very clever design. 